uh, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for the time for the setup. It's uh, the year of uh, Linux in the desktop. Um, so thanks for the PyCon organizers. Uh, the event is going really well so far, so that's great. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, everything you want to know about Kubernetes, uh, preferably before using it. Uh, so my name is Guillaume Jolin. Uh, you can find me on the internet uh, pretty much everywhere under the, under the name of uh, Ramnes. So if you want to contact me, here is the link. Uh, I'm working for a company called Numberly. We, which does uh, data marketing. Uh, if you want to know more, just come and see me uh, at the end. And we're recruiting, as everyone. Uh, so small caveat emptor. Uh, this presentation is more uh, a, a f an experience feedback than a theoretical class. Um, Kubernetes is a very broad topic and you won't leave this room knowing everything about it. Uh, but what I hope to do is to have you know what I would have uh, liked to know <laughs> when I started using Kubernetes. Uh, so the idea is that if you don't use Kubernetes yet, uh, you can choose wisely whether or not you, you need to use it, if you want to operate it yourself or not. Uh, and maybe if you use it already, maybe I have a few tricks. Uh, that's the idea of the talk. But it's definitely oriented towards uh, beginners. Um, so, chapter one, uh, the origins. Uh, so, where are we are coming from? Uh, so, at Numberly, we had this uh, a tool called, called uh, DeployDocus, which was really great. Uh, basically, it was a, a click click interface where. Yes? De quoi? You can. De quoi? Ah, j'ai perdu le full screen. Euh... Ok. Je peux... Yeah. I can't do better than this. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, it, but anyway, there is not much to see. It's, it's just like an interface we had where you could uh, choose a project uh, and then uh, and then just click uh, on a button to deploy it, choose a server, uh, click uh, yes, and it would deploy like on the server or, or in the whole cluster. So uh, what was great with uh, DeployDocus is that it was easy to understand and use. Uh, it had a very low time uh, to production. It was pretty much uh, hackable because it was just Ansible script, so you could uh, in the repository of your project, you could uh, modify the Ansible task and do pretty much what you wanted uh, to do at the deployment time. Uh, it was pretty f fancy and did a, a great job for years. Uh, but the problem with DeployDocus is that uh, it supported only Python project and static files. So if a developer wanted to, to, to push like a, a Redis database or, or a, a Go application or anything, well, he had to wait uh, on the infrastructure team so that they deploy new servers uh, for the, dev the developer use case. Um, it was impossible to undeploy or list uh, what was currently running uh, on the servers, so not good, especially for a short-lived uh, project. Uh, and the real problems were that it was old, buggy, unmaintained, um, no one was responsible for it, uh, and we had production incident because uh, application developed this, uh, deployed this way, had um, some memory leaks, uh, and we had no uh, way on the servers to uh, to limit uh, the memory and CPU usage. And so, uh, overall, uh, developer were uh, really dependent on the infrastructure team for any uh, uh, innovation work. So, at this time we had uh, Kubernetes. Sorry, I'm just taking some water. So at this time we saw uh, Kubernetes, uh, which was uh, pretty, pretty new at when we started looking at it. It was like uh, uh, three years ago or something. Uh, so what is Kubernetes?
So um, Kubernetes is, is uh, so it, it, when when you have a Kubernetes cluster, you have uh, a master uh, server, uh, one or more master server, and you have uh, a few nodes. Uh, on the nodes, there is like uh, one or two daemons that are running, mainly the kubelet, uh, which is uh, the Kubernetes daemon. Uh, that makes uh, the node register with uh, the master and communicate with it. So inside a node, uh, so you have th that kubelet I was talking about, you have pods, uh, and pods are the smallest unit Kubernetes uh, handle. So in the pod, you can have one or more containers, you can have uh, volumes, and that's all. Uh, so that's it. And each pod has, has an IP, obviously. Um, and how does that work uh, on the developer side? Uh, on the developer side, you just uh, write uh, uh, some YAML files. Oh, I'm sorry, it's so bad. Um, I, I can't do anything, I'm sorry. But um, So it's basically YAML uh, where you describe uh, what you want to deploy. So the YAML here that you don't see. <laughs> Uh, uh, is uh, specifying a, a deployment object, which has a name hello, which has one replica, and which deploys the container uh, called numberly slash hello. So in a few lines of uh, YAML, you say, hello, here is my container, please deploy it in one instance for me. And then how do you deploy this? Uh, you just uh, write, uh, you, you have a, a small uh, CLI tool which is called kubectl. And with kubectl, you can apply uh, the YAML file you just wrote. And doing this uh, will create a deployment uh, object inside the master. So the master uh, role is to, to keep your uh, desired state uh, of the cluster. So the deployment will be registered in the master. And as, you, as, as we said, uh, uh, I want one instance of uh, numberly hello. It will deploy that instance, so it will create one pod with one container inside the node, uh, inside one of the three nodes we have here. Uh, but what if we want more than one node because our application is very popular or anything? Uh, well, we can just uh, write a small command called kubectl scale. Uh, and, that, and say we want now four replicas instead of, instead of one. I, I could have said uh, 100 replicas, like it, it doesn't change anything. So you specify a new number of, re of replicas. It's going to update the deployment uh, which is uh, registered in the master. Uh, so the master will now have a deployment of four instances and will do whatever it's needed to deploy uh, three other instances of your uh, container. Uh, but the problem with uh, the, the problem with this is that we have four pods, so four IPs. We don't have a single uh, unified IP. So for this, we need to create a service. Uh, a service is another kind of uh, object inside Kubernetes, uh, and uh, basically it's just uh, okay. Uh, take uh, whatever uh, instance of my application and just uh, put a single IP. Uh, in front of it, and this IP is never going to change. Whereas pod IP are not meant to be uh, uh, long term, so they can change any, any time. So we just apply the service, and now we have uh, our four instances uh, of our uh, container, and we have, uh, and we have that uh, IP uh, 236. Uh, which binds to uh, to the three pods and, it, and which is going to distribute the load uh, uh, randomly. Uh, and the great thing is that uh, once you have done this, you can just write kubectl get all and just see everything that's running. So here we see that we have uh, one pod uh, called uh, hello, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, the example is wrong. We should have four pods, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so we have one pod, uh, one service with uh, the cluster IP, which is specified. Uh, the, deploy the deployment we made at the beginning, and the replica set is basically an object which is created by the deployment automatically. Uh, so why would you want Kubernetes? Uh, 
in our case, uh, this were the, the, the arguments in favor of Kubernetes. So we wanted our developers to be uh, autonomous. So basically now, if uh, a developer wants to push uh, a Redis database or a Go application, well, it's just a container, so go ahead. Uh, everyone has the same tooling uh, for all the developer all the developer teams and also uh, the infrastructure teams, everyone is speaking the same language. You can uh, write once and apply everywhere a lot of things. Uh, for example, observability, you can write, uh, you can deploy uh, uh, some software which is going to analyze every communication made uh, between every uh, uh, pod in your cluster uh, and uh, just uh, uh, throw a graph of everything. Like it's, you can, you can really, uh, uh, capitalize on the fact that everyone is using the same uh, cluster and the same technology. Uh, for example, also uh, for the logs, you can automate all the logs of all the application in a, in an uh, unified way. Uh, so yeah, observability, uh, logs, uh, security also, you can have the same security practices for everyone, and, and a lot of other things. Um, you have uh, 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 some free uh, resiliency, uh, basically uh, self-healing. Uh, if an application goes down, uh, Kubernetes is going to uh, re restart it automatically. It's going to detect that it's not uh, working anymore and restart it. So it doesn't, you, it doesn't give you highly available applications. Uh, if you want highly available applications, uh, you should uh, handle this in your code base, not uh, rely on Kubernetes for this. But it gives you uh, the chance to, to, to restart something that's not working anymore uh, without uh, having to call your astreint or whatever. Uh, and you've got resources or isolation thanks to, uh, to the containers. So no more uh, server which is going down bef because of uh, memory leaks. Uh, and in the end, so, this is a, a graph uh, I, really uh, I really like, uh, which I took on the internet, uh, props to uh, the, ma the man who made it. Uh, but it's, you can see Kubernetes as a, a, a bridge between uh, software engineers and infrastructure engineers. engineers. Uh, to me, uh, I know that I use Kubernetes, I really see it uh, as like the, the the, the DevOps paradise, <laughs> because yeah, everyone is speaking the same language. Uh, software engineers are autonomous. Infrastructure engineers can just uh, work uh, on the server parts, and everyone is happy. Uh, so the minimum viable cluster. Uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, what you get uh, with Kubernetes uh, out of the box. Uh, and before this, uh, tell you about the requirements we settled on. So we wanted uh, our cluster to be on-premise uh, with a simple networking component and highly available. Uh, why simple networking component? Is because uh, when you install Kubernetes, by default, you don't have networking. So Kubernetes itself doesn't provide its networking. So basically, Kubernetes itself doesn't work. <laughs> have to install uh, a, a software which is going to handle the networking in, inside Kubernetes. And you have a lot of offers. Uh, but so what we wanted is, was a very simple one because we, there is like very uh, complex stuff, but we wanted something simple. Uh, so the just choices we made in terms of technology, what, anyway. Uh, so when I said on-premise, we could have run our cluster on VMs, but we decided, uh, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to go ba the bare metal way. So uh, we're using those blade, those big blade servers uh, because it's easy to rack new servers, and when you use Kubernetes, you, you might want to add more nodes uh, pretty, pretty soon. Uh, we run them uh, on gen gentle Linux. Uh, mostly because we have several maintainers uh, at Numbly, uh, so it's easy for us to uh, to maintain uh, Kubernetes uh, on the distribution, and because uh, it has that blading hedge uh, mentality, which is very important when you want to run Kubernetes because it moves very really really fast. 
And everything we've done is uh, automat automated with uh, Ansible. For the networking part, we choose uh, kubrouter. Uh, so why we choose kubrouter rather than, uh, rather than uh, another uh, uh, CNI, uh, so networking uh, software? It's because uh, it's, it's used standard Linux mechanisms. Uh, it's store-free. You don't need a database behind it for it to work. Uh, it's turnkey. Basically, it's really, really, really simple to install and run and mostly because it has BGP uh, capabilities. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, for those that don't know BGP, BGP is a networking protocol where uh, uh, it's basically what's uh, uh, powering internet. With BGP, a, a server or, or, or router is capable of saying to every other router, hello, uh, if you want to contact this IP, well, just go my route. Uh, and this is great because inside this protocol, there is a lot of things that's, that are going to be useful for us. Uh, so we want, as I said, we wanted our cluster to be highly available. So we spawned uh, three master servers uh, with uh, a TCD which is deployed on the street. Um, those three uh, servers are talking between each other uh, with standard watching and uh, are talking to a router uh, through BGP. And we have three nodes on the other side which are where every communication uh, between those and to the router are in BGP. So what's cool with BGP is that if tomorrow I want to add another node, I can, ju I, I can just provision it and it's going to be added to the cluster automatically uh, uh, through the network protocol. So we don't have to configure new routes or, or anything. It's just going to spawn and be there. Um, <coughs> <coughs> also, what's great is that if a node is, uh, goes down, uh, the exact opposite will happen. The, the, the node is going to, uh, to be removed from the cluster. Uh, and the other great thing is that there is a full mesh, uh, BGP full mesh between all nodes, which means that uh, a container can be spawned in any node and all the nodes will know about this IP uh, very soon. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, the router is, uh, is in a master-slave configuration. Primary, secondary, sorry. Um, so if the router goes down, it will be automatically switched to the other router and uh, you won't see anything. Uh, so what you get or miss at this point? So you can deploy and run container in a resilient manner. You can see what's running and undeploy if needed. And that's all. <laughs> you can do anything else. You can access your pod outside the Kubernetes cluster. Um, <coughs> you can't, uh, you, your auto authentication is just uh, uh, certificates that you can't even uh, revoke. Uh, you have no authorization mechanism like uh, any, anyone is admin on the cluster. Uh, you don't have any sort of observability whatsoever. So yeah, Kubernetes out of the box is like you can do much with it. So there is this uh, very smart guy called uh, Kelsey Itower, which is uh, a developer advocate at Google, which, say, which said on Twitter, uh, Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. It's a better place to start, not the end game. So now I'm going to uh, discuss about what we built on top of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so we had to take a few more choices. Uh, those choices are mainly about security and developer experience. So for security, we decided to uh, encrypt ETCD, which is not encrypted by default. We decided that uh, people should log in with uh, uh, the Google sign-in uh, and not uh, with uh, cert uh, SSL certificates. 
uh, we decided to add uh, RBAC, uh, which is basically saying, uh, okay, this person has the right to uh, do this or this in the cluster, but not this. For example, uh, they can uh, 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 spawn a container, but they can't uh, delete one, for example. Each team uh, has its own namespace. So a namespace is a very light isolation between uh, different environments uh, inside Kubernetes. You can imagine it's like, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it's like having uh, uh, several uh, clusters, but you only have one. Uh, it's still a, a lighter isolation than if you had multiple clusters. So, um, we decided to uh, have several pod security policies. So a pod security policy is a mechanism in Kubernetes where you can say, okay, uh, every pod uh, has to respect this rule or this rule. So we decided to use two main rules, which are uh, must run as non-root, which means that a container uh, can't uh, run a process as a root, and read-only uh, root file system, which means that which means that the container can't uh, uh, modify uh, its own file system. So if it needs to uh, to write a state or anything, it has to create a volume for this. <coughs> we also uh, added a default network policy. So a network policy is pretty much the same as a pod security policy, but for networking. And uh, for our networking, we decided to uh, deny any uh, ingress traffic by default. Uh, so if uh, someone has to uh, contact a, a pod through a database or something, uh, they should add uh, the network policy saying, hey, please authorize this and this. Uh, it's just a YAML file, just like deployments and services, and it's pretty easy to write. What's great about this is that it gives to the developer uh, the hand of on the network part, which is not something they're used to. <coughs> oh. oh, sorry. I'm even crying. Uh, and last thing we implemented is the limit range and quotas. So uh, basically, it's what's saying uh, in this namespace you can spawn you can spawn up to n nodes uh, n pods. Sorry. So you can limit the number of pods in namespace as the right to spawn, uh, and each pod has uh, max uh, uh, can use uh, up to uh, one CPU and one gig of RAM. Uh, so you can uh, you can specify those limit range and quotas, but it's not there by default. So by default, if a developer wants to spawn uh, a thousand uh, pods and down the Kubernetes cluster, well, it's just going to happen. Uh, I mean, it's not going to down the Kubernetes cluster, but people won't be able to spawn anything else. Uh, so there is that. Whoops, sorry. There is that thing called uh, the CIS, the Center for Internet Security, uh, which is a big organization, uh, which is providing a, a, a security benchmark for Kubernetes. <coughs> and uh, we're uh, fully compliant to it. Check it out if, uh, if, you, if you want to operate a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, for the developers, we wanted to automate uh, as much as possible uh, we wrote tutorials, templates, uh, documentation uh, on the specificities of our cluster, and we uh, recreated this uh, Kubernetes certification, which is internal to uh, Numbly, but we help us to be sure that in every team there is someone which is competent enough with Kubernetes and that can help people uh, around them. Uh, so the tool we decided to use, uh, first there is uh, Gangway, which is uh, done by the guy at, at Epsio. Uh, basically with Gangway you can just uh, sign in, choose your uh, Google account, click download your uh, Kubernetes config, and then, uh, and then uh, you just have to put the, the, the config at the proper place and you can use the cluster. So. Uh, the developer, it's pretty easy for them to connect. They don't have to do a lot of uh, uh, weird stuff. It's just uh, one click and one move to the proper directory. 
Uh, the other thing you want uh, to use when you're uh, on-premise, uh, at least bare metal, uh, is metal LB. So as I said, uh, uh, straight out of the box, uh, you, don't have, you don't have access to your pods outside the cluster. So if you want to, uh, if you want to access the pods outside the cluster, you've got to create uh, load balancer uh, services. But the load balancer services are not implemented by default in Kubernetes. <coughs> so you've got to add uh, some software to handle load balancer services. Uh, and uh, there is this thing called MetalLB, which is basically just, uh, it, it can work with two mods. It can either just uh, select uh, an IP from a pool of IP and, uh, and give it to your uh, CNI or just uh, uh, announce the, the external IPs for you. Uh, Nginx, I'm not going to present it, but um, uh, we wanted a single entry point, uh, so we use this. There is this object called ingress inside Kubernetes, uh, which is uh, uh, basically an Nginx configuration, uh, and where, where you can define a host name and where, uh, which pod you're going to, to target. Uh, there is uh, external DNS, uh, which basically takes ingress definitions and create a DNS record automatically. So if I say I want my uh, pod to, to listen on uh, uh, toto.numberly.com, uh, automatically external DNS will see that and create the record. You don't have to uh, create manual record and point to IPs. And there is the equivalent for uh, SSL certificates, which is called Cert Manager. Uh, so it's going to talk with Let's Encrypt to create uh, a certificate for your domain. Uh, the tool we developed ourselves, uh, there is GitLab to airbag, which is basically taking the, the rights uh, inside GitLab and apply the same rights inside Kubernetes. So if you're a developer on GitLab, uh, you're going to be a developer uh, on Kubernetes. So you, have, you will have uh, rights uh, according to your role. And we developed uh, Kubeman, which is something that uh, pops uh, notifications on Matamos, but it can also uh, does on email, uh, pretty much anything. Uh, when something changed on the cluster. Uh, and uh, a few, a few things we, we didn't release yet, uh, Sandbox Cleaner, which is uh, a cron job, so something that uh, runs every day, which cleans a namespace called Sandbox, so that people can do pretty much anything uh, in this namespace. Uh, and Pudge, uh, uh, a Kubernetes webhook that validate that the config files that are deployed in Kubernetes are uh, good according to uh, our, uh, our rules. So nowadays, uh, the current platform status, we have 14 teams using it, uh, 100 users and 400 pods running. Uh, live demo, I don't have time nor the laptop, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and the next steps, uh, we are going to work uh, pretty hard on the development workflow with developers uh, so that they're really happy to, to use the cluster. Uh, we are going to, to, to implement continuous delivery with GitLab CI, I guess. Uh, what would be great also is a real storage system because right now it's just uh, manually allocated uh, NFS volumes, so it's not that great. Uh, something like Ceph would be great. Vertical and horizontal scaling so that uh, basically, uh, it's just uh, small parts of Kubernetes that you can add to the cluster where you say, okay, take this uh, deployment and if you see that uh, it's using 100% uh, of its CPU, well, spawn another instance, or you can also say, uh, modify the resource limits. So it's uh, vertical is please add more CPU and horizontal is please uh, spawn another node, uh, another pod. Distributed tracing, so it was what I was talking uh, previously, like uh, uh, taking all the communication between every pod and seeing what's happening between them. And for one request coming in the cluster, you can you could see like everything that happened in the cluster. Uh, Chaos monkeys, so basically deploying something that's going to undeploy other things uh, and uh, regularly kill random uh, pods on the cluster just to see is it working, like is it resilient, really. And uh, hopefully more nodes. I think we have like 10 nodes coming in, uh, in, in the month. 
so let's step back. So our opinion on Kubernetes is that we are uh, really inside it. So it's becoming an industry standard. Uh, really, uh, more and more people are using it, uh, and the, the, the vocabulary of Kubernetes is, is going to, to be more and more standard. Uh, the great thing about uh, Kubernetes is that if it's the standard way to deploy your application, and you're going from uh, company A to company B, and that both companies are using uh, Kubernetes, then you don't have to, to learn an yet another way to deploy application. It's just standard. Uh, so this is really great, and for people coming in the company, it's great also that we can onboard them faster. Uh, I, I discussed about uh, deploy docus and its problems. Well, it, it really solved most, most of them. Oper operating Kubernetes is complex, but using it is not. Uh, frankly, uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, operating Kubernetes yourself unless you, rea you have real reason to, but uh, you should really use it, I guess. Um, well, not in all use cases, obviously, but in most use cases, I think you can use Kubernetes. Uh, for the, on the developer side, it's really great. But it still has uh, a few missing pieces, especially if you're operating it yourself on bare metal. Uh, the proof is we had to uh, develop uh, a few things. And like, we used to joke about the fact that if we made the we, we, we made the cluster, I think uh, we finished, we finished at this point uh, something like six months, one year ago. Uh, if we made it three years ago, we used to joke about the fact that it just wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, so a few recommendations. Uh, so if you didn't try uh, the user side of uh, Kubernetes or already, I would really recommend you to. Uh, there is this thing called uh, kubesail, which is providing uh, one CPU, one node uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster, but it's like you, you can uh, spawn much uh, resources inside it, but you can use it uh, to to do your hand with kubectl and understand how it works on the developer side. Uh, for production, there is a lot of offers, uh, but I would really recommend uh, Google Kubernetes Engine because they are the ones with uh, the most experience with Kubernetes because, <laughs> well, Google made Kubernetes in the first place. Uh, and so they are, uh, they are pretty much in advance uh, in comparison to all other uh, Kubernetes uh, providers. And yes, as I said, operate Kubernetes only if you can dedicate people and have good reasons to. Thank you. Yeah, you, I said that operating uh, Kubernetes is hard, but uh, using it is not. Well, the difference is that uh, when I, what I mean by operating is uh, deploying your own Kubernetes cluster on your own servers uh, and managing it yourself, uh, rather than using a, 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 a Google Kubernetes engine, for example, a cluster or a, a provider. But using it like as a developer, uh, there is a, a small learning curve, but Frankly, it's not that big, and the advantages are huge. Yes? Yeah. So right now, uh, we are using uh, Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so I, I, I've discussed about uh, <coughs> continuous uh, delivery. Uh, so did I did I put something in place already, or do I have ex some experience with it? Uh, so right now we are at the point where we automatically automatically build uh, the containers uh, when there is like a push on your master branch on GitLab, uh, and when you tag. Uh, or whatever, uh, well, we, we are able to uh, build the container it's, uh, automatically, so it's uh, CI more than TD, I guess. Uh, we, we use Kaneko for this, uh, K-A-N-E-K-O. Uh, uh, it works uh, really nice. Uh, but we didn't yet uh, go up to uh, spawn the thing. Uh, 
honestly, we are not very far from it. I think it's going to be in the next month or two. Uh, but uh, there is in GitLab there is a, a Kubernetes integration, uh, which seems really interesting. Uh, this is maybe one uh, lead we are going to follow. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yes. So I didn't uh, talk about monitoring and logs. Uh, did we put something in place already? Yes, uh, I didn't speak about. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I didn't speak about it because it was slightly out of scope, and that uh, I would have so many things to tell or, uh, otherwise. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, so right now we have uh, two things. So we have all the logs uh, which are going to a, a gray log instance. Uh, of uh, all the all the master logs and uh, all the, the pod logs, uh, but we're not super satisfied with gray log. Uh, we, we're mainly using it because it was already in place, uh, so we might try something else. Uh, one thing we've started to try is Loki, uh, so it's basically uh, the same as uh, as Prometheus, but for logs, <coughs> and you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, see your logs directly inside Grafana. Uh, but it's not very stable nor uh, very ma mature yet, so we might try something else. Uh, and for, uh, for metrics, yeah, we have uh, a few Grafana dashboards. Uh, uh, we have Prometheus, uh, uh, we have a, a completely dedicated Prometheus cluster, which is scrapping pretty much everything inside Kubernetes. So uh, if you throw a pod, uh, a pod inside the cluster, you, out of the box, you have metrics for it. Uh, for all ingresses also, like for all host name, you can uh, know uh, without doing anything, like we already have a Grafana uh, dashboard where you can see all the, the requests that are made, uh, or if you have uh, 200 or any other status code, uh, you can uh, see the response time, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of, of graphs, we're uh, pretty good. We also have a dashboard where we, where we see the, the the state of the cluster itself, like uh, uh, what is our percentage of uh, resource usage, uh, uh, how many IPs uh, did we allocate uh, uh, in comparison to the total IP we, c we could allocate, uh, a lot of things. Yep. So the question is, do we use uh, multiple data centers? And if so, did we experience that <coughs> everything goes down if we get the link uh, because of uh, IPVS? Uh, so basically, uh, in Kubuter, you can all not use IPVS. Uh, for now, we're not using it because we didn't have, uh, like we didn't reach the limits of not using IPVS, uh, but one day we're going. So we're not using IPVS uh, in the first place. Uh, and no, we decided that the cluster is going to be on one data center, and if we want multiple data centers, uh, we are just going to spawn another cluster in the other data center. So I can't answer, I'm sorry. Yes? Okay, uh, is there a rule uh, as to uh, how many applications you should uh, uh, run on a cluster. So, um, no, there is no rule. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so the guidelines are that, I mean, the standard practice is to have uh, a maximum of uh, 250 pods uh, per node, if I remember correctly. So then you just do the math uh, according to the number of nodes you have. Uh, no, I, I, I guess one, one big advantage of Kubernetes is that it's going to do some uh, optimization on resource usage, so it's going to do bin packing. So if you have, uh, uh, for example, uh, a lot of uh, web application that takes a lot of requests during the day, but also uh, some uh, uh, data jobs uh, that runs the night, well, it's going to run the jobs uh, on the same servers uh, that the web app because uh, on the night uh, the, the resource usage is pretty low. So it's going to optimize and you can reduce the number of uh, servers you have. So I would say that, well, th yeah, there is no rule. I mean, you could have advantages to uh, do only one app per cluster, like uh, a strong security isolation. I mean, maybe it's it may, maybe it has sense for uh, uh, security companies and uh, and government companies or stuff like that. Uh, but most of the time, from what I saw, you're going to have uh, a few, like uh, really tens or, or hundreds of apps per cluster. Yes? I hope this is not too much of a tension, but uh, you know, we're all hearing about all these buzzwords about like the new infrastructure as a code, infrastructure as a service, etc., etc. It's really kind of a part of this. How does it compare to things like Docker Swarm or like AWS Lambda, serverless kind of architecture? <sighs> yeah, uh, it's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a huge question. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, uh, oh, those, uh, I mean, there is a lot of buzzwords uh, around uh, uh, infrastructure as code, etc. Uh, how does it compare to uh, Docker Swarm or, or uh, AWS uh, Lambda? Um, <laughs> we can discuss outside if you want. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you.